The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter Sixteen. The Boat Launched. We Visit the Coral Reef. The Great Breaker That Never Goes Down. Coral Insects. The Way in Which Coral Islands Are Made. The Boats Sail. We Tax Our Ingenuity to Form Fish Hooks. Some of the Fish We Saw. And a Monstrous Whale. Wonderful shower of little fish. Water spouts. It was a bright, clear, beautiful morning when we first launched our little boat and rowed out upon the placid waters of the lagoon. Not a breath of wind ruffled the surface of the deep. Not a cloud spotted the deep blue sky. Not a sound that was discordant broke the stillness of the morning, although there were many sounds, sweet, tiny and melodious that mingled in the universal harmony of nature the sun was just rising from the pacific's ample bosom and tipping the mountain tops with a red glow the sea was shining like a sheet of glass yet heaving with the long deep swell that all the world round indicates the life of ocean and the bright seaweeds and the brilliant corals shone in the depths of that pellucid water as we rode over it, like rare and precious gems. Oh, it was a sight fitted to stir the soul of man to its profoundest depths, and if he owed a heart at all, to lift the heart in adoration and gratitude to the great creator of this magnificent and glorious universe. At first, in the strength of our delight, we rode hither and thither without aim or object, but after the effervescence of our spirits was abated, we began to look about us and to consider what we should do. "'I vote that we row to the reef,' cried Peterkin. "'And I vote that we visit the islands within the lagoon,' said I. "'And I vote we do both,' cried Jack. "'So pull away, boys.' As I have already said, we had made four oars, but our boat was so small that only two were necessary. The extra pair were reserved in case any accident should happen to the others. It was therefore only needful that two of us should row, while the third steered by means of an oar, and relieved the rowers occasionally. First we landed on one of the small islands and ran all over it, but saw nothing worthy of particular notice. Then we landed on a larger island, on which were growing a few coconut trees. Having not eaten anything that morning, we gathered a few of the nuts and breakfasted. After this, we pulled straight out to sea and landed on the coral reef. This was indeed a novel and interesting sight to us. We had now been so long on shore that we had almost forgotten the appearance of breakers, for there were none within the lagoon. But now as we stood beside the foam-crested billow of the open sea, all the enthusiasm of the sailor was awakened in our breasts and as we gazed on the widespread ruin of that single magnificent breaker that burst in thunder at our feet, we forgot the coral island behind us, we forgot our bower and the calm repose of the scented woods, we forgot all that had passed during the last few months, and remembered nothing but the storms, the calms, the fresh breezes, and the surging billows of the open sea. This huge ceaseless breaker, to which I have so often alluded, was a much larger and more sublime object than we had at all imagined it to be. It rose many yards above the level of the sea, and could be seen approaching at some distance from the reef. Slowly and majestically it came on, acquiring greater volume and velocity as it advanced, until it assumed the form of a clear watery arch which sparkled in the bright sun. On it came with resistless and solemn majesty. The upper edge lipped gently over, and it fell with a roar that seemed as though the heart of the ocean were broken in the crash of tumultuous water, while the foam-clad coral reef reappeared to tremble beneath the mighty shock. We gazed long and wonderingly at this great sight, and it was with difficulty we could tear ourselves away from it. As I have once before mentioned, this wave broke in many places over the reef, and scattered some of its spray into the lagoon, but in most places 
the reef was sufficiently broad and elevated to receive and check its entire force. In many places the coral rocks were covered with vegetation, the beginning, as it appeared to us, of future islands. Thus, on this reef we came to perceive how most of the small islands of those seas are formed. On one part we saw the spray of the breaker washing over the rocks and millions of little, active, busy creatures continuing the work of building up this living rampart. At another place, which was just a little too high for the waves to wash over it, the coral insects were all dead, for we found that they never did their work above water. They had faithfully completed the mighty work which their Creator had given them to do, and they were now all dead. Again, in other spots, the ceaseless lashing of the sea had broken the dead coral in pieces and cast it up in the form of sand. Here sea birds had alighted, little pieces of seaweed and stray bits of wood had been washed up, seeds of plants had been carried by the wind, and a few lonely blades of bright green had already sprung up, which, when they died, would increase the size and fertility of these emeralds of ocean. At other places these islets had grown apace, and were shaded by one or two coconut trees, which grew literally in the sand, and were constantly washed by the ocean spray. Yet, as I have before remarked, their fruit was most refreshing and sweet to our taste. Again at this time Jack and I pondered the formation of the large coral islands. We could now understand how the low ones were formed, but the larger islands cost us much consideration, yet we could arrive at no certain conclusion on the subject. Having satisfied our curiosity and enjoyed ourselves during the whole day in our little boat, we returned somewhat wearied, and withal rather hungry, to our bower. Now, said Jack, as our boat answers so well, we will get a mast and sail made immediately. So we will, cried Peterkin as we all assisted to drag the boat above high water mark. We'll light our candle and set about it this very night. Hurrah, my boys, pull away! As we dragged our boat we observed that she grated heavily on her keel, and as the sands were in this place mingled with broken coral rocks, we saw portions of the wood being scraped off. Hello, cried Jack on seeing this. That won't do. Our keel will be worn off in no time at this rate. So it will, said I, pondering deeply as to how this might be prevented. But I am not of a mechanical turn naturally, so I could conceive no remedy save that of putting a plate of iron on the keel. But as we had no iron, I knew not what was to be done. It seems to me, Jack, I added, that it is impossible to prevent the keel being worn off thus. Impossible? cried Peterkin. My dear Ralph! you are mistaken. There is nothing so easy. How? I inquired in some surprise. Why, by not using the boat at all, replied Peterkin. Hold your impotent tongue, Peterkin, said Jack as he shouldered the oars. Come along with me and I'll give you work to do. In the first place you will go and connect coconut fiber and set to work to make sewing twine with it. Please, Captain, interrupted Peterkin, I've got lots of it made already, more than enough, as a little friend of mine used to be in the habit of saying every day after dinner. Very well, continued Jack, then you'll help Ralph to collect coconut cloth and cut it into shape, after which we'll make a sail of it. I'll see to getting the mast and the gearing, so let's to work. And to work we went, right busily, so that in three days from that time we had set up a mast and sail with the necessary rigging in our little boat. The sail was not, indeed, very handsome to look at, as it was formed by a number of oblong pieces of cloth, but we had sewed it well by means of our sail-needle, so that it was strong which was the chief point. Jack had also overcome the difficulty about the keel by pinning to it a false keel. This was a piece of tough wood, of the same length and width as the real keel, and about five inches deep. He made it of this depth because the boat would be thereby rendered not only much more safe, but more able to beat against the wind, 
which in a sea where the trade winds blow so long and so steadily in one direction was a matter of great importance. This piece of wood was pegged very firmly to the keel, and we now launched our boat with the satisfaction of knowing that when the false keel should be scraped off we could easily put on another, whereas should the real keel have been scraped away we could not have renewed it without taking our boat to pieces, which Peterkin said made his marrow quake to think upon. The mast and sail answered excellently, and we now sailed about in the lagoon with great delight and examined with much interest the appearance of our island from a distance. Also we gazed into the depths of the water and watched for hours the gambols of the curious and bright-colored fish among the corals and seaweed. Peterkin also made a fishing line, and Jack constructed a number of hooks, some of which were very good, others remarkably bad. Some of these hooks were made of iron wood, which did pretty well, the wood being extremely hard, and Jack made them very thick and large. Fish there are not particular. Some of the crooked bones in fish heads also answered for this purpose pretty well. But that which formed our best and most serviceable hook was the brass finger ring belonging to Jack. It gave him not a little trouble to manufacture it. First he cut it with the axe, then twisted it into the form of a hook. The barb took him several hours to cut. He did it by means of constant sawing with the broken pen knife. As for the point, an hour's rubbing on a piece of sandstone made an excellent one. It would be a matter of much time and labor to describe the appearance of the multitudes of fish that were day after day drawn into our boat by means of the brass hook. Peterkin always caught them, for we observed that he derived much pleasure from fishing, while Jack and I found ample amusement in looking on, also in gazing down at the coral groves and in baiting the hook. Among the fish that we saw, but did not catch, were porpoises and swordfish, whales and sharks. The porpoises came frequently into our lagoon in shoals, and amused us not a little by their bold leaps into the air and their playful gambols in the sea. The swordfish were wonderful creatures, some of them apparently ten feet in length, with an ivory spear six or eight feet long projecting from their noses. We often saw them darting after other fish, and no doubt they sometimes killed them with their ivory swords. Jack remembered having heard once of a swordfish attacking a ship, which seemed strange indeed, but as they are often in the habit of attacking whales, perhaps it mistook the ship for one. This swordfish ran against the vessel with such force that it drove its sword quite through the thick planks, and when the ship arrived in harbor long afterwards, the sword was found still sticking in it. Sharks did not often appear, but we took care never again to bathe in deep water without leaving one of our number in the boat to give us warning if he should see a shark approaching. As for the whales, they never came into our lagoon, but we frequently saw them spouting in the deep water beyond the reef. I shall never forget my surprise the first day I saw one of these huge monsters close to me. We had been rambling about on the reef during the morning, and were about to re-embark in our little boat to return home, when a loud blowing sound caused us to wheel rapidly round. We were just in time to see a shower of spray falling, and the flukes or tail of some monstrous fish disappear in the sea a few hundred yards off. We waited some time to see if he would rise again. As we stood, the sea seemed to open up at our very feet. An immense spout of water was sent with a snort high into the air, and the huge blunt head of a sperm whale rose before us. It was so large that it could easily have taken our little boat, along with ourselves, into its mouth. It plunged slowly back into the sea, like a large ship foundering, and struck the water with its tail so forcibly as to cause a sound like a cannon shot. We also saw a great number of flying fish, although we caught none, and we noticed that they never flew out of the water except when followed by their bitter foe, the dolphin, for whom they thus endeavored to escape. But of all the fish that we saw, none surprised us so much as those that we used to find in shallow pools after a shower of rain. 
and this not on account of their appearance, for they were ordinary-looking and very small, but on account of their having descended in a shower of rain. We could account for them in no other way, because the pools in which we found these fish were quite dry before the shower, and at some distance above high water mark. Jack, however, suggested a cause which seemed to me very probable. We used often to see water spouts in the sea. A water spout is a whirling body of water which rises from the sea like a sharp pointed pillar. After rising a good way, it is met by a long tongue which comes down from the clouds, and when the two have joined, they look something like an hourglass. The water spout is then carried by the wind, sometimes gently, sometimes with violence, over the sea, sometimes up into the clouds, and then bursting asunder, it descends in a deluge. This often happens over the land as well as over the sea, and it sometimes does much damage, but frequently it passes gently away. Now Jack thought that the little fish might perhaps have been carried up in a water spout, and so sent down again in a shower of rain, but we could not be certain as to this point, yet we thought it likely. During these delightful fishing and boating excursions we caught a good many eels, which we found to be very good to eat. We also found turtles among the coral rocks and made excellent soup in our iron kettle. Moreover, we discovered many shrimps and prawns, so that we had no lack of variety in our food, and indeed we never passed a week without making some new and interesting discovery of some sort or other, either on the land or in the sea. End of chapter 16 Recording by Tom Weiss The Coral Island by R. M. Ballantyne. Chapter 17 A Monster Wave and Its Consequences. The Boat Lost and Found. Peterkin's Terrible Accident. Supplies of Food for a Voyage in the Boat. We Visit Penguin Island and Are Amazed Beyond Measure. Account of the Penguins. One day, not long after our little boat was finished, we were sitting on the rock at Spouting Cliff, and talking of an excursion which we intended to make to Penguin Island the next day. "'You see,' said Peterkin, "'it might be all very well for a stupid fellow like me to remain here and leave the penguins alone, but it would be quite inconsistent with your characters as philosophers to remain any longer in ignorance of the habits and customs of these birds.' So the sooner we go, the better. Very true, said I. There is nothing I desire so much as to have a closer inspection of them. And I think, said Jack, that you had better remain at home, Peterkin, to take care of the cat, for I am sure the hogs will be at it in your absence, out of revenge for your killing their great-grandmother so recklessly. Stay at home, cried Peterkin. My dear fellow, you would certainly lose your way, or get upset if I were not there to take care of you. "'Ah, true,' said Jack gravely. "'That did not occur to me. No doubt you must go. Our boat does require a good deal of ballast, and all that you say, Peterkin, carries so much weight with it that we wouldn't need stones if you go. Now, while my companions were talking, a notable event occurred, which, as it is not generally known, I shall be particular in recording here. While we were talking, as I have said, we noticed a dark line, like a low cloud or fog bank on the seaward horizon. The day was a fine one, though cloudy, and a gentle breeze was blowing, but the sea was not rougher or the breaker on the reef higher than usual. At first we thought that this looked like a thunder cloud, and as we had had a good deal of broken weather of late, accompanied by occasional peals of thunder, we supposed that a storm must be approaching. Gradually, however, this line seemed to draw nearer without spreading up over the sky, as would certainly have been the case if it had been a storm cloud. Still nearer it came, and soon we saw that it was moving swiftly towards the island, but there was no sound till it reached the islands out at sea. As it passed these islands we observed, with no little anxiety, 
that a cloud of white foam encircled them and burst in spray into the air. It was accompanied by a loud roar. This led us to conjecture that the approaching object was an enormous wave of the sea, but we had no idea how large it was till it came near to ourselves. When it approached the outer reef, however, we were awestruck with its unusual magnitude, and we sprang to our feet and clambered hastily up to the highest point of the precipice, under an indefinable feeling of fear. I have said before that the reef opposite Spouting Cliff was very near the shore, while just in front of the bower it was at a considerable distance out to sea. Owing to this formation the wave reached the reef at the latter point before it struck at the foot of Spouting Cliff. The instant it touched the reef we became aware, for the first time, of its awful magnitude. It burst completely over the reef at all points with a roar that seemed louder to me than thunder, and this roar continued for some seconds while the wave rolled gradually along towards the cliff on which we stood. As its crest reared before us we felt that we were in great danger and turned to flee, but we were too late. With a crash that seemed to shake the solid rock the gigantic billow fell, and instantly the spouting holes sent up a gush of water spouts with such force that they shrieked on issuing from their narrow vents. It seemed to us as if the earth had been blown up with water. We were stunned and confused by the shock, and so drenched and blinded with spray that we knew not for a few moments whither to flee for shelter. At length we all three gained an eminence beyond the reach of the water. But what a scene of devastation met our gaze as we looked along the shore! This enormous wave not only burst over the reef, but continued its way across the lagoon and fell on the sandy beach of the island with such force that it passed completely over it and dashed into the woods, leveling the smaller trees and bushes in its headlong course. On seeing this, Jack said he feared our bower must have been swept away, and that the boat, which was on the beach, must have been utterly destroyed. Our hearts sank within us as we thought of this, and we hastened round through the woods towards our home. On reaching it we found, to our great relief of mind, that the force of the wave had been expended just before reaching the bower, but the entrance to it was almost blocked up by the torn-up bushes and tangled heaps of seaweed. Having satisfied ourselves as to the bower, we hurried to the spot where the boat had been left, but no boat was there. The spot on which it had stood was vacant, and no sign of it could we see on looking around us. "'It must have been washed up into the woods,' said Jack, hurrying up the beach as he spoke. Still no boat was to be seen, and we were about to give ourselves over to despair when Peterkin called to Jack and said, "'Jack, my friend, you were once so exceedingly sagacious and wise as to make me acquainted with the fact that coconuts grow upon trees. Will you now be so good as to inform me what sort of fruit that is growing on the top of yonder bush? For I confess to being ignorant, or at least doubtful on the point. We looked towards the bush indicated, and there, to our surprise, beheld our little boat snugly nestled among the leaves. We were very much overjoyed at this, for we would have suffered any loss rather than the loss of our boat. We found that the wave had actually borne the boat on its crest from the beach into the woods, and there launched it into the heart of this bush, which was extremely fortunate, for had it been tossed against a rock or tree it would have been dashed to pieces, whereas it had not received the smallest injury. It was no easy matter, however, to get it out of the bush and down to the sea again. This cost us two days of hard labor to accomplish. We had also much ado to clear away the rubbish from before the bower, and spent nearly a week in constant labor ere we got the neighborhood to look as clean and orderly as before, for the uprooted bushes and seaweed that lay on the beach formed a more dreadfully confused-looking mass than one who had not seen the place after the inundation could conceive. Before leaving this subject I may mention for the sake of those who interest themselves in the curious natural phenomenon of our world, 
that this gigantic wave occurs regularly on some of the islands of the Pacific once and sometimes twice in the year. I heard this stated by the missionaries during my career in those seas. They could not tell me whether it visited all of the islands, but I was certainly assured that it occurred periodically in some of them. After we had got our home put to rights, and cleared of the debris of the inundation, we again turned our thoughts to paying the penguins a visit. The boat was therefore overhauled and a few repairs done. Then we prepared a supply of provisions, for we intended to be absent at least a night or two, perhaps longer. This took us some time to do, for while Jack was busy with the boat, Peterkin was sent into the woods to spear a hog or two, and had to search long, sometimes ere he found them. Peterkin was usually sent on this errand when we wanted a pork chop, which was not seldom, because he was so active and could run so wonderfully fast that he found no difficulty in overtaking the hogs, but being dreadfully reckless he almost invariably tumbled over stumps and stones in the course of his wild chase, and seldom returned home without having knocked the skin off his shins. Once, indeed, a more serious accident happened to him. He had been out all the morning alone, and did not return at the usual time to dinner. We wondered at this, for Peterkin was always very punctual at the dinner hour. As supper time drew near we began to be anxious about him, and at length sallied forth to search the woods. For a long time we sought in vain, but a little before dark we came upon the tracks of the hogs which we followed up until we came to the brow of a rather steep bank or precipice. Looking over this we beheld Peterkin lying in a state of insensibility at the foot, with his cheek resting on the snout of a little pig which was pinned to the earth by the spear. We were dreadfully alarmed, but hastened to bathe his forehead with water and had soon the satisfaction of seeing him revive. After we had carried him home, he related to us how the thing had happened. "'You must know,' said he, "'I walked about all the forenoon, till I was as tired as an old donkey, without seeing a single grunter, not so much as a track of one. But as I was determined not to return empty-handed, I resolved to go without my dinner, and—' "'Wait!' exclaimed Jack. "'Did you really resolve to do that?' "'Now, Jack, hold your tongue.' returned Peterkin. I say that I had resolved to forgo my dinner and to push to the head of the small valley, where I felt pretty sure of discovering the hogs. I soon found that I was on the right scent, for I had scarcely walked half a mile in the direction of the small plum tree we found there the other day, when a squeak fell on my ear. Ho, ho, said I, there you go, my boys, and I hurried up the glen. I soon started them, and singling out a fat pig ran tilt at him. In a few seconds I was up with him and stuck my spear right through his dumpy body. Just as I did so I saw that we were on the edge of a precipice, whether high or low I knew not, but I had been running at such a pace that I could not stop, so the pig and I gave a howl in concert and went plunging over together. I remembered nothing more after that till I came to my senses, and found you bathing my temples, and Ralph wringing his hands over me. But although Peterkin was often unfortunate in the way of getting tumbles, he was successful on the present occasion in hunting, and returned before evening with three very nice little hogs. I also was successful in my visit to the mud flats, where I killed several ducks so that when we launched and loaded our boat at sunrise the following morning we found our store of provisions to be more than sufficient. Part had been cooked the night before, and on taking note of the different items we found the account to stand thus. Ten breadfruits, two baked, eight unbaked. Twenty yams, six roasted, the rest raw. Six taro roots, fifty fine large plums. Six coconuts, ripe six ditto, green for drinking, four large ducks and two small ones, raw, three cold roast pigs with stuffing. I may here remark 
that the stuffing had been devised by Peterkin specially for the occasion. He kept the manner of its compounding a profound secret, so I cannot tell what it was, but I can say with much confidence that we found it to be atrociously bad, and after the first tasting scraped it carefully out and threw it overboard. We calculated that this supply would last us for several days, but we afterwards found that it was much more than we required, especially in regard to the coconuts, of which we found large quantities wherever we went. However, as Peterkin remarked, it was better to have too much than too little, as we knew not to what straits we might be put during our voyage. It was a very calm, sunny morning when we launched forth and rowed over the lagoon towards the outlet in the reef, and passed between the two green islets that guarded the entrance. We experienced some difficulty and no little danger in passing the surf of the breaker, and shipped a good deal of water in the attempt, but once past the billow we found ourselves floating placidly on the long, oily swell that rose and fell slowly as it rolled over the wide ocean. Penguin Island lay on the other side of our own island, at about a mile beyond the outer reef, and we calculated it must be at least twenty miles distant by the way we should have to go. We might, indeed, have shortened the way by coasting round our island inside of the lagoon, and going out at the passage in the reef nearly opposite to Penguin Island, but we preferred to go by the open sea, first because it was more adventurous, and secondly because we should have the pleasure of again feeling the motion of the deep, which we all loved very much, not being liable to seasickness. "'I wish we had a breeze,' said Jack. "'So do I,' cried Peterkin, resting on his oar and wiping his heated brow. "'Pulling is hard work. Oh, dear, if we could only catch a hundred or two of these gulls, tie them to the boat with long strings, and make them fly as we want them, how capital it would be! "'Or bore a hole through a shark's tail, and reeve a rope through it, eh?' remarked Jack. "'But I say, it seems that my wish is going to be granted, for here comes a breeze. Ship your oar, Peterkin. Up with the mast, Ralph. I'll see to the sail. Mind your helm. Look out for squalls.' This last speech was caused by the sudden appearance of a dark blue line on the horizon which, in an incredibly short space of time, swept down on us, lashing up the sea in white foam as it went. We presented the stern of the boat to its first violence, and in a few seconds it moderated into a steady breeze, to which we spread our sail and flew merrily over the waves. Although the breeze died away soon afterwards, it had been so stiff while it lasted that we were carried over the greater part of our way before it fell calm again so that when the flapping of the sail against the mast told us it was time to resume the oars, we were not much more than a mile from Penguin Island. "'There go the soldiers!' cried Peterkin as we came in sight of it. "'How spruce their white trousers look this morning! I wonder if they will receive us kindly. Do you think they are hospitable, Jack?' "'Don't talk, Peterkin, but pull away, and you shall see shortly.' As we drew near to the island, we were much amused by the maneuvers and appearance of these strange birds. They seemed to be of different species, for some had crests on their heads, while others had none, and while some were about the size of a goose, others appeared nearly as large as a swan. We also saw a huge albatross soaring above the heads of the penguins. It was followed and surrounded by numerous flocks of seagulls. Having approached to within a few yards of the island, which was a low rock, with no other vegetation on it than a few bushes, we lay on our oars and gazed at the birds with surprise and pleasure, they returning our gaze with interest. We now saw that their soldier-like appearance was owing to the stiff, erect manner in which they sat on their short legs, bolt upright, as Peterkin expressed it. They had black heads, long sharp beaks, white breasts, and bluish backs. Their wings were so short that they looked more like the fins of a fish, and indeed we soon saw that they used them for the purpose of swimming under water. There were no gills on these wings, 
but a sort of scaly feathers, which also thickly covered their bodies. Their legs were short and placed so far back that the birds, while on land, were obliged to stand quite upright in order to keep their balance, but in the water they floated like other waterfowl. At first we were so stunned with the clamor which they and other seabirds kept up around us that we knew not which way to look, for they observed the rocks in thousands, but as we continued to gaze we observed several quadrupeds, as we thought, walking in the midst of the penguins. "'Pull in a bit,' cried Peterkin, "'and let's see what these are. They must be fond of noisy company to consort with such creatures. To our surprise we found that these were no other than penguins, which had gone down on all fours and were crawling among the bushes on their feet and wings, just like quadrupeds. Suddenly one big old bird, that had been sitting on a point very near to us, gazing in mute astonishment, became alarmed, and scuttling down the rocks, plumped or fell, rather than ran, into the sea. It dived in a moment, and, a few seconds afterwards, came out of the water ahead with such a spring and such a dive back into the sea again that we could scarcely believe it was not a fish that had leaped in sport. "'That beats everything,' said Peterkin, rubbing his nose and screwing up his face with an expression of exasperated amazement. I've heard of a thing being neither fish, flesh, nor fowl, but I never did expect to live to see a brute that was all three together, at once, in one. But look there, he continued, pointing with a look of resignation to the shore. Look there, there's no end to it. What has that brute got under its tail? We turned to look in the direction pointed out, and there saw a penguin walking slowly and very sedately along the shore with an egg under its tail. There were several others, we observed, burdened in the same way, and we found afterwards that these were a species of penguin that always carried their eggs so. Indeed, they had a most convenient cavity for the purpose, just between the tail and the legs. We were very much impressed with the regularity and order of this colony. The island seemed to be apportioned out into squares, of which each penguin possessed one, and sat in stiff solemnity in the middle of it, or took a slow march up and down the spaces between. Some were hatching their eggs, but others were feeding their young ones in a manner that caused us to laugh not a little. The mother stood on a mound or raised rock, while the young one stood patiently below her on the ground. Suddenly the mother raised her head and uttered a series of the most discordant cackling sounds. "'She's going to choke!' cried Peterkin. But this was not the case, although, I confess, she looked like it. In a few seconds she put down her head and opened her mouth, into which the young one thrust its beak and seemed to suck something from her throat. Then the cackling was renewed, the sucking continued, and so the operation of feeding was carried on till the young one was satisfied but what she fed her little one with we could not tell. "'Now look just yonder,' said Peterkin in an excited tone. "'If that isn't the most abominable piece of maternal deception I ever saw. That rascally old lady penguin has just pitched her young one into the sea, and there's another one about to follow her example. This, indeed, seemed to be the case, for on the top of a steep rock close to the edge of the sea we observed an old penguin endeavoring to entice her young one into the water, but the young one seemed very unwilling to go, and notwithstanding the enticements of its mother moved very slowly towards her. At last she went gently behind the young bird and pushed it a little towards the water, but with great tenderness, as much as to say, "'Don't be afraid, darling. I won't hurt you, my pet.' But no sooner did she get it to the edge of the rock where it stood looking pensively down at the sea, then she gave it a sudden and violent push, sent it headlong down the slope into the water, where its mother left it to scramble ashore as it best could. We observed many of them employed in doing this, and we came to the conclusion that this is the way in which old penguins teach their children to swim. Scarcely had we finished making our remarks on this, 
when we were startled by about a dozen of the old birds hopping in the most clumsy and ludicrous manner towards the sea. The beach here was a sloping rock, and when they came to it some of them succeeded in hopping down in safety, but others lost their balance and rolled and scrambled down the slope in the most helpless manner. The instant they reached the water, however, they seemed to be in their proper element. They dived and bounded out of it and into it again with the utmost agility, and so, diving and bounding and sputtering, for they could not fly, they went rapidly out to sea. On seeing this, Peterkin turned with a grave face to us and said, "'It's my opinion that these birds are all stark, staring mad, and that this is an enchanted island. I therefore propose that we should either put about ship and fly in terror from the spot, or land valorously on the island and sell our lives as dearly as we can. I vote for landing, so pull in, lads,' said Jack, giving a stroke with his oar that made the boat spin. In a few seconds we ran the boat into a little creek where we made her fast to a projecting piece of coral, and running up the beach entered the ranks of the penguins, armed with our cudgels and our spear. We were greatly surprised to find that instead of attacking us, or showing signs of fear at our approach, these curious birds did not move from their places until we laid hands on them, and merely turned their eyes on us in solemn, stupid wonder as we passed. There was one old penguin, however, that began to walk slowly towards the sea, and Peterkin took it into his head that he would try to interrupt its progress. So he ran between it and the sea and brandished his cudgel in its face. But this proved to be a resolute old bird. It would not retreat, nay, more, it would not cease to advance, but battled with Peterkin bravely, and drove him before it until it reached the sea. Had Peterkin used his club he could easily have felled it, no doubt, but as he had no wish to do so cruel an act merely out of sport, he let the bird escape. We spent fully three hours on this island in watching the habit of these curious birds, but when we finally left them we all three concluded, after much consultation, that they were the most wonderful creatures we had ever seen, and further we thought it probable that they were the most wonderful creatures in the world. End of chapter 17 Recording by Tom Weiss